A Sampler in Time, the story behind the Roland S50 sampler. Before we get into the focus of this video, I'd like to give a brief history of sampling technology leading up to the mid 80s. To understand sampling technology, we have to go all the way back to the 1960s and look at one of the first analog samplers, the Mellotron. Using magnetized tape strips that move across a magnetic head while a key is pressed, the sound recording on the tape plays back the sampled sound. On the Mellotron, this system was recreated for each key. Bands such as the Moody Blues, the Beatles, and Tangerine Dream were heavy users of the Mellotron and its unique eerie sound. A lot of this strangeness and playback was due to wow and flutter, the slight variations of the speed and alignment of the tape as it went across the playback head. Using this same principle, digital sampling technology emerged in the late 1970s. As 8-bit microprocessors and computers were pieced together to create a system in which recorded sounds could be quickly accessed and played back from digital memory. Thus, similar to how the tape loops worked, but in digital form, a standard keyboard could be used to control the playback easily. This is what Kim Ryrie and Peter Vogel at Fairlight discovered in the late 1970s, coining the phrase sampling to describe the recording and playback of sounds from digital memory. In 1979, the world's first digital sampler, the Fairlight CMI Model 1, was released at a cost of about $25,000 US. Early adopters such as Peter Gabriel and Stevie Wonder helped popularize the technology by using it for creating unusual sounds such as breaking glass and rhythmical sound effects and then adding these tracks to their music. Samples and keyboard settings could be saved on giant 8-inch floppy disks and recalled by loading them from disk to digital memory. Although groundbreaking, the Fairlight CMI Model 1 was still very limited in memory and did not have the music sequencer software at this early stage. In 1980, shortly after the Fairlight release, Roger Lin applied the same principles to the Lin LM1 drum machine, where drum samples were stored in permanent digital memory on EEPROMs and then played back as needed when a button was pressed or the sequence triggered the required sample located at that specific memory location. Dave Russum and Scott Wedge at Emu Systems quickly realized they could use this technology to bring a much cheaper sampler to the market, and in 1981 released the first emulator. The 8-bit Emulator 1 featured a 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive for sound storage, 128 kilobytes of RAM for playback memory, and a 27 kilohertz sample rate. This gave approximately 2 seconds of sampling time in each of the two 2 octave voice banks. At $8,000 US, the emulator still sold well and was used by bands such as New Order, Genesis, and on Michael Jackson's Thriller album. By 1982, digital technology was becoming more advanced and Fairlight CMI2, with a price tag of a whopping 50000 US, was released. Although still an 8-bit machine, the most exciting new feature was the system software, which featured the Page R, the music sequencer where entire songs could be constructed with the use of a light pen, manipulating graphics and edible notes on the screen. This was groundbreaking technology and Peter Gabriel famously used the Fairlight CMI2 on his album Security. At this point, we recommend you take a coffee break. In 1982, New England Digital also added sampling capabilities to its Rolls-Royce FM synth workstation, the Synclavier, making their system one of the first workstation-type synthesizer samplers available at a whopping price tag. In 1982, PPG also updated its system by adding the Wave term, which gave the PPG 2.2 a visual display and the ability to sample, edit, and playback audio. However, one cannot talk 8-bit sampling without the mention of another huge breakthrough in cost, 1984's Isonic Mirage. Priced at $1,700 US, this instrument brought sampling into a much more affordable level for the non-professional musician. With 128 kilobytes, a floppy disk drive, and the variable sample rate from 10 to 33 kilohertz gave up to 6.5 seconds of sampling time for each keyboard half. Because of this, the Mirage was a huge seller. 
The 8-bit sampler was not over yet. In 1984, Emulator's second sampler, the Emulator 2, was released and truly broke through as the sampler to have in pop music. It featured an improved 27k sample rate using digital companion technology, a huge 1 megabyte sample memory, and updated onboard digital sample editing features. The Emulator 2 was everywhere in pop music and can be seen by bands such as New Order, The Pet Shop Boys, Depeche Mode, and even Ferris Bueller had an emulator too. 1985 ushered in the era of the 12-bit sampler, and also the start of an era where future sampler powerhouse Akai took over the market share. Akai's S612 was its first sampler and had a maximum sampling time of 8 seconds at 4 kHz or 1 second at 32 kHz, and a ridiculously low price tag of 995 US dollars. It was a sampler anyone could own. The Akai S900. By 1986, Akai had released the New Look S900, a 12-bit professional sampler with almost 1 megabyte of memory and up to 40k sample rates. With ease of editing samples and the relatively low cost, samplers had officially taken off as an instrument common to any electronic music producer's studio. So now we're up to date with the focus of this video, the Roland S50 digital sampler. It was new times for Roland as they had yet to release a sampler up until now, and they wanted to do it right. Roland was also embracing the digital revolution in music full on. So as a company transitioning from analog synthesizers to new digital technology, the Roland S50 signaled the start of Roland's digital era. Roland wanted to build a sampler that fit the needs of a professional musician, but at a fraction of the cost of the high-end brands such as Fairlight and Emulator. When released in 1986, the dealer price of an S50 was $2,700, and it had some very attractive features. These features were a reasonably large memory, 750 kilobytes, with two banks of sample memory for a total of 7.2 seconds at 30K for each bank, 12-bit sample resolution, the ability to play multiple samples at once with 16 voices, four assignable outputs, though these were not available at launch, a floppy drive, and a port for connecting a video CRT for advanced editing. This overall package was significantly cheaper than any other samplers with similar specs, such as the Fairlight. With the elimination of knobs on the recent Alpha Genos and JXAP, Roland was entering a new design era where futuristic sleek Spartan panels with buttons and editing via the Alpha dial were now the norm, and this signaled a change in direction from the analog tactile control to a purely digital interface. Striking. S50 yeah. is a striking design, and I yeah. think, I yeah. think from an from an industrial design perspective, it still holds up today. To it be does. honest with you, it's it is it's, it's almost you know because its design was was clearly you know from the very beginning designed to be you know fully dependent on the CRT, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and the and the mouse and then the DT100 digitizer tower yeah. was going to be connected to it as well. They, you know, Roland just went completely extreme and minimalist design yeah. on the front panel. It's like you can, you can barely turn it on with oh, the controls that are on there. Yeah, right? if and, you don't uh, have to rival high-end competitors, the addition of the DT100 digitizer tablet gave the sampler a feature only the Fairlight had: the ability to edit and modify wave data with a stylus interface. Such a modern feature. The optional monitor, which could be interfaced to a proprietary DIN SCART connection on the back of the sampler, gave the user a look at a whole new way of sampling and editing with the S50. A rich and detailed OS was the key to operating the S50 with any ease. Roland spent a lot of time creating a functional operating system that provide easy sample and playback management, but ultimately the S50's stock 32-digit FL display was very limiting for any sort of visual sample editing. Most users worked with the CRT display option, which drastically improved the usability of the S50. With the OS and CRT combo, sampling, sample editing, tone editing, key grouping, disk management, and other system functions were all relatively easy. The S50 also provided two ways of mixing a sample as played on a key press. Velocity mode, where velocity mixes the levels between samples, and crossfade, where the samples are crossfaded between each other on key press. Within eight months, the S50 1.2 OS was replaced by OS 2.0. 
adding true multi timbral assignment of MIDI channels to tone groups. Also with the ability to play back 16 voices at once and assign voices to multiple outputs. This was extremely handy for composers. Roland's S50 sampler was supported by a very robust release of now famous Roland sound libraries. These libraries added a tremendous amount of value to the sampler, as a box of floppy disks could easily be purchased to instantly give the owner excellent sounds of great quality for most any instrument desired. One of my favorite libraries is the RSB502, which contains great strings, a very usable MIDI stack, and of course, the famous Air Disk. So what is it about the S50 that really makes it worthwhile to own today? Well, it's the sound. The S50 has that typical punchy 12-bit sound that you expect from certain 80 samplers, but Roland engineers added internal DSP to the playback of each sampled waveform to eliminate aliasing when a sample is played slower than its sample frequency. For some reason, this causes sounds played an octave or more below the original sample to develop a really great dense grainy character. I feel this is a really highly usable sound in the music I make. just because it looked so amazing and the and we could talk about this in more detail but the differential interpolation technology that yes Roland had pioneered for, yeah. uh, for, for the S series sampler which instantly from just a pure fidelity uh, perspective and yeah. then the ability to transpose a sample across a wider range it just leapt ahead of Mm -hmm. anything else mm -hmm. um in the 8 and 12 bit families that were kind oh. of popular at that time it's like wow you figured out something here there's other parts of it that still yeah. aren't great yeah uh in the design and there's some areas where you know maybe a kai's got a, a leg up and what have you but a lot of those were then also corrected by the time the s550 came along with the s50 roland also released its little brother the roland s10 I actually bought an S10 from Long McQuaid in Victoria, BC in 1987 for $899 new. This was a dream for me as I was able to add sampling to my small but fun home studio setup which included a Korg Poly 800 and an MSQ100 sequencer. The S10 had four banks of sampling and could select between 30kHz and 50kHz sample rate in each bank for a maximum of 8 seconds total sample time. The S10 had a simple arpeggiator, this feature was not found on the S50, and lets you play samples in ways you might not have otherwise thought of. All of this data can be saved on a single 2.8 inch quick disc similar to the Akai S612. It was a lot of fun. In 1987, Roland followed up the S50 with the beefed up S550 rack sampler, and the S550 had double the memory at 1.5 megabytes, and the ability for options such as an external SCSI hard drive. The S550 also supported the ability to use a proprietary MU1 mouse, which helped with the navigation on the CRT display. The S550 also included Roland's time variant filter, which is not included on the S50, and it sounds pretty decent. In general, the S550 was a much more useful workhorse sampler, and was a very popular addition to the S series samplers. Nineteen eighty seven also saw the release of Roland's Director S sequencer for the S fifty and S five fifty. Director S is a relatively simple to use sixteen channel MIDI sequencer for the S series samplers, which utilize the sound data loaded into sampler memory, but also could synchronize with other MIDI devices such as the MC five hundred. This software completed Roland's quest to give Fairlight level features to their S series sampling system. I've used Director S to make a few songs, and it's pretty fun, although a bit clunky, and it's not very practical today as compared to what a modern DAW provides.
In the end, Roland's high ambitions for the S50 and S550 were somewhat curtailed by excellent competition, with the likes of Akai's extremely popular S950, Emu's Complex Emulator 3, and Sonic's EPS samplers, and other fringe players in the sampler market such as Yamaha, Sequential, and even Korg. This definitely made the S50 somewhat rarer to find in a studio or touring setup, but with the S50, Roland definitely delivered on its goal to bring affordable sampling technology with a large feature set to the masses. Its sleek design is still endearing to me as something very 80s, and although obsolete by today's mega sampling standards, the sound set and sampling graininess makes it something I still find a place for in my music today. <laughs> 